Vince Digitano is an assistant coach at Fordham, where he works with the linebackers as well as spends a lot of time looking at tackling. It's one of his areas of expertise. Back before the 2018 season, though, Vince just accepted the head football job at SUNY Maritime five days before the season started. I know right now we're all faced with limited practice time, and I wanted to rerun this episode because I felt there was just a ton to learn from here in his approach and some of the things that he did through the season to help improve their culture as well as build their culture. You didn't have a lot of time. So whether you're somebody who has had all your practice time limited or you are a new head coach, I think this will be a valuable podcast to you. We also talk quite a bit about our advanced tackling system. You can find that at footballdevelopment.com. Welcome to USA Football's Coach and Coordinator Podcast, where top football coaches from around the country share their stories, philosophies, concepts, and strategies to help you get better on and off the field. Now, here's your host, Keith Grabowski. Welcome to another week of deliberate practice, and I am joined, as always, with, by my guest host, Andy Ryland. Andy, it's great to have you here. Coach, pleasure to be on again. Obviously, love the season, love the series, and, and for the third week in a row, we have another guest host with us. Yes, and that guest host is Vinny Digatano, who is the head football coach at SUNY Maritime this past season. Vinny had an incredible situation, which he's going to tell us about, where he got ready for a season in five days, took the job over and had five days till they started. Uh, but he's also going to talk to us a lot about tackling. So, Vinny, it's great to have you here. Thanks again for having me, Keith, and uh, always a pleasure to talk to you too, Andy. Well, Vinny, before we get into some of this tackling stuff, you and I had talked beforehand, and we were talking about you know the lessons you can really pull out of being in the situation that you were, and you took over a job with with five days to go before the season started, before camp started, and you know what we said. One of the big takeaways is that when you have five days. You really have to get laser focused on what are the most important things. And I think when we can we can do that, not just with five days, but with an entire off season to go, that we can put together something special. So what were some of those things that you really got laser focused on? Well, I mean, first it was uh beyond that it was it was really a, an interesting situation because in the spring I was actually in two different places. I was at Wagner for spring practice. We had started spring practice there. And then in the middle of the spring practice, ended up actually at Fordham as a special teams quality control. So I was, in t- I had two different experiences just in, in the span of that previous spring by itself. And then into the summer with a brand new staff at Fordham and having the opportunity to work with coach common over there and coach rice for a short period of time. I definitely learned a lot of different, different ways to do things than I had in the prior place um, with coach Haas. But just kind of like settling into it. And then you come out to the end of the summer. I had actually reported to camp at Fordham. And uh, this happened a day after reporting to camp and actually doing all the introductions with a brand new team, a brand new staff. So for him to be able to really support me in that way, I, I really owe him a lot in that short period of time, Coach Common over at Fordham for doing it. Just being around two great head coaches over the last couple of years in, and three actually, Coach Austin at two and, and Coach Haas and, and Coach Common, I was really able to see especially at different stages of where they were at in their development, like kind of like how to be a head coach. And, and then as I was doing it, you know, you always have that vision. You have that vision for like, what if I'm ever in this seat, what would I do first? What would I do? And then all of a sudden you're in the seat. And everything that you plan for, everything that you ever envisioned, how it happened, everything down to like my first press conference and the, and the way that you would go down and the introduction to the team and everything just went right out the window. Like all of that went right away like nothing that you can ever even imagine. And it was pretty much overnight. So I think for us, one of the things, first of all, is staffing. In a short period of time, we had some staff that had remained there, brought in some new people that were over there too. So right away, it was like getting my room together. First, actually, let me go back up one step before that. Number one was like family. More than anything else, when you talk about laser focus, you talk about, let me let me start with saying like really sitting my family down and making sure that they were part of that whole entire process, knowing that there was a monumental task that was probably going to have, and I was going to be on the run for pretty much the entire season. So to sit them down and kind of really explain to them, especially having young kids, where we're going to be, and they grow attached to places that you end up with. They grow attached to coaches that you're with, and they're not going to see them anymore. So to have them understand that this is a good, positive thing, and you still obviously 
will be where you can be when you can be there was number one more than anything else. And then you start getting into the staffing side of it. When you start to sit down and say, like, the timing is always impeccable, too. It's to say, like, hey, like, we're going to have to have a vision. I, I'm changing a vision from, from the previous head coach who I happen to learn a lot from and work for for 10 years. That's how I put in the situation. That's why I was one of the people in the situation was with Clayton had taken the job, uh, Kendrick Holmes taking the job over at, at West Point. And when having the opportunity to do it, you had such a strong development, developmental culture that was there that I understood everything from the regimental atmosphere to the, just the core values of the program, like everything in between. I had to go ahead and kind of like revisit some of those things that really had become embedded in what I do to begin with and just go back and speak the same language to those players. So to get the staff together to really like lay out my expectations and to really learn from them right away too, to be able to say like, where, where, what has been going on here? Uh, like what, what are the procedures? Um, the biggest thing for me, especially with a lot of veteran kids on the team, was trying to keep as much familiarity as in place as possible for them. And it wasn't about my vision for what a football team would be. It was more about what, what makes them comfortable to help them perform. They had a lot of uncertainty. I, you know, a little bit about maritime colleges. You have kids that are coming off of a ship. That some of them had spent 90 days overseas on a ship right there. Spending 90 days overseas, in the middle of that 90 days, they had been informed that their head coach was leaving for another job and then had total uncertainty as to who, who was going to be coming in for the, for the next person. So we actually got named, that, uh, got named the head coach on August the 5th, and that ship came back into port on our campus on August the 10th. So they were actually coming off of it during the, during the morning, and that night we actually had practice. So that was all happening all in one shot. And we also had our freshmen coming on. So we also had freshman families going on. So first and foremost was making sure to really put the staffing together. Next thing was to make sure to reach out to players once the announcement came out. And we almost did it almost like it was like it was like signing day almost. Like we got everybody to get on the phone with as many of our team leaders as possible, some people that we wanted to talk to, and just get them on the phone and make sure to introduce himself. Did a little research, obviously, in the brief time that I had ahead of him, um, knowing who the leadership was, be able to speak to who I can, let them know, obviously, what we're what we're about, what we're doing, really kind of like create that excitement to see them. And then the other piece of it too was in that week ahead, just kind of learning more than anything else, like how the how the operation worked. And you go from a place where it's the next is an O's place to it's a dollars and cents place. So you start talking about budget, you start talking about booking buses, you start talking about booking hotels, you start registering and booking meeting rooms and classrooms and just meals and where everything goes and how you structure all that and everything like that. So the focus was more so on the operation to make sure that there was nothing that fell off from the, from, from the previous year, that the expectation was still going to be high in every, in every way, shape or form. And then the other part of it, too, was obviously just at, at any opportunity that we have to be able to enhance that, enhance that experience for the players, because ultimately those are the things that kind of they look at and say, and they see like, oh, this person's not organized or this is not there. Or last year we were here, this happened and now it didn't happen. So that was like the, one of the major, major keys. And then also be able to evaluate and, and put to, and put something into play, but create, again, as much familiarity as possible right away. And then obviously the ease of, with their parents and meeting with their parents, especially freshman parents who we did not recruit. Now I'm standing in front of and saying to them that we're here to make the experience. The one great thing about the place is that the place sells itself and there's no problem with whoever the coach is. Is you go there for a purpose, and a lot of them that do go there for a purpose do very well, not only career-wise, but they do well leadership-wise, too. So that's something you can build on as well. It wasn't a place that I wasn't familiar with academically and the challenges that are there, too. So it was good to be able to support on all ends. But to remain focused on all of that stuff, like put a little bit of the football aside for a second and trust the fact that your coaches are able to kind of pick up some of those things, and then you kind of like keep on adding as you go along. Yeah, <laughs> Boy, you're drinking out of the fire hose there. I guess for our listeners, I think there's one more element we need to add into this. Essentially that this is not your day job. You you actually <laughs> are a, a principal uh, of, of not one eight school, but eight schools in, in uh, New York. Yeah, yeah, so that happens too. Yeah, so that was also in my spare time. <laughs> yeah, there's also something else too. So, you know, to be able to rely on the staff that's in the office there during the day, being able to go ahead and, uh, in, in, in essence, to be able to do this uh, before and after school and on the weekends and everything too. Yeah, so that's also a challenge. I've had a lot of experience with it in the past, but it was, again, it was again the biggest thing is trust mm -hmm. and be able to trust that the people are going to be able to do what they need to do when they need to do it. So. Incredibly helpful as well, and then bringing some people around me. And but the thing was, is about the the core values of the program really helped it too. So yeah, that's me. <laughs> Can you uh, just share with us the, the the core values you have set up in the program? 
So actually, and the, and the thing was is about the core values that were set up is they were set up at the inception of the program. When Coach Holmes brought the program in the modern era back in 2005, he had brought a group of core values together, one of them being work ethic, another one being accountability, another one being respect, and then another one being character, and another one being enthusiasm. So we, in the original program kind of like description of it too, these were in essence the core values that were brought. One of the things that we did well, he looked, revisited probably about like three or three in the program was like, we I wanted to make it more that they really were involved with it and became like a staple of what it was. And you didn't feel like they remembered them enough. So we actually made an acronym and we added another core value, which was family that tied it all together. So it was a core value called Warface that was together. And it's been a program staple since 2000 and probably about five, six around there that we've done. And, and uh, as a matter of fact, we actually, they actually elect a, a, a captain each week, a Warface captain who is, brings out a flag. Now, the original flag was actually on a World War II ship that was donated from a friend of Coach Holmes's, which now hangs in the lobby because uh, it's, it's uh, not only been through World War II, but it's also taken a beating on a couple of buses. So we've made, we decided to retire that. And we have a replica now with the pirate flag that, that goes out. So, uh, But it's something that is very close to them. We publicize a lot through it with it too, but it's something that stays with that and everybody that goes through that entire program. So for me to be able to walk in day one and be able to speak that language for players that I had never coached before because I've been out of there for three seasons and everybody that I was there with last graduated. It was, in essence, an ability for me to connect to those players right away. Then I know one of the things you focused on and what we wanted to, to get to in this podcast was some of the tackling stuff. And you and I have talked on this podcast, I think twice now, about tackling. And topic we wanted to focus on today is really getting specific with your tackling drills and mani- manipulating those to fit the opponent each week because you're going to find different things with the way your players are going to fit, who's going to fit, etc. And you really got laser focused on those types of things in order to be able to help your players. And for you, this this goes back to the five-fight philosophy of, of Richie Gray, which is going to be in our advanced tackling system. We'll give our listeners the information on that at the end of the podcast. But what I really found interesting is you put the five fights on the back of a T-shirt along with the main coaching points those players are going to hear again and again and again. And, you know, when I was talking to you beforehand, you said, you know, there's the opportunity for those guys maybe to be standing in a line and they see it right in front of them all the time. I thought that was a, a very good approach to that, but also just that idea that these are our beliefs and now we got to get the behaviors out of it. They read shirts. That's remarkable. I, it, you don't think about it a lot of times. We put the slogan on shirts, and I can't realize this a little bit. But the players like like to read the shirts. We have a lot of, obviously, student-athletes, no matter what academically they do, and we have some high academic kids at Maritime, but they tend to float, and they tend they tend just when they're standing around or waiting their turn or it's not their rep, they tend to float away and sometimes and think about other things in the course of the day. So one of the things we actually did do is we actually put the basically the PowerPoint uh, slide that we would use for like something on actually the back of the shirt um, because a lot of times I found that we introduce these coaching points at a at one stop and then we move on from them mm-hmm. and the amount of times that we actually would have that and the player would come over and actually ask when they talk about hey what does that mean cleats in the grass in the grass or what is what does dip time actually mean and then you're able to kind of like get them to kind of kind of be part of like the learning and they, they they have a little bit of inquiry based stuff where they're able to say like hey what is that and then you're explaining it to them like oh that's what that means that again it's that constant reinforcement because a lot of times when you were we found that front of the shirt you know gives like the slogan put the back of the shirt gives the coaching points because a lot of the times you're probably facing the one person doing the drill and the other people are right behind you so they're constant the constant reinforcement of what they're saying is to go up and then it also keeps it on track with the coaches, too, to be able to stay to the coaching points and this way not to go ahead and be obscure in the coaching points with something that is so fundamental, like tackling. It's just over and over and over again. And, and being able to bring that into into this phase, because now being at different levels and being at different phases of it, coming in in springs, coming in in falls, like ultimately we try to put our year-round program in, but when you're not afforded the year-round opportunity for a program, like you just have to figure out and start to start cutting from somewhere. I think for for the most part, we saw the the vast improvement of uh, of what their skill set was. We we're at Wagner and we were at some other places. You know, we had a spring to introduce it, and when we introduced it in that spring, and then by the time in the summer you have the summer workouts and stuff, by the time they come back in, 
you know, the, the younger guys fall in line because they know the drill already and they know the coaching points. We just, every, it was like an everybody at once kind of thing that happened over there, plus coaches who had never coached it either. So I was coaching coaches to coach it. And like, so that was it. <laughs> so you're trying to put it all together. So, Andy, I'll let you jump in here. I mean, what do you think of, you've seen these T-shirts before, the coaching points on the back of the T-shirt. Well, obviously, I'm a huge fan. I think I had wondered, and you know, we've spoke, you know, is that something that originated because of the lack of time and you felt it was a, an interesting way to, to reinforce it to your players to get your terminology instilled quickly? But coming off the back of it, I mean, is this something that you would do again? You know, you'll do at, at your next program, at your next stop with the next class of freshmen. Is this something, you know, that other coaches can copy and just how that – kind of knee-based uh, solution that appeared now might become a staple. Well, and the other thing, Andy, as I've probably spoken to you about before, it, it forces the coaches to learn it because Andy knows the following. If you can't coach it, you can't have it. That's the other thing, too. So, so nope, not everybody gets the shirt. So everybody, it's not one of those things that you come in and say, where's my gear? And everybody picks up their gear and keeps going and they be able to fly the flag. But if you're not able to go ahead and you have to – the one thing for my coaches is like they want the shirt. They have to come in and coach me on it before they can have the shirt and wear it too. So I'm not going to, we're not going to be hypocritical and just have coaching points out there for somebody who can't do it. So it kind of, again, it, it holds them accountable to another level uh, of, of doing it too. And I would absolutely do it again, just because I feel like it's just something, even if it's on a, a broader scale, you know, budgetarily, uh, something that you could do, but it's something I, you're going to have a, you're going to pretty much wear something with a logo on it. I'm just going to take advantage of every opportunity that's there, especially with the, with the time and just the constant, constant reinforcement, the constant reinforcement kind of thing. And players like rewards and players like players like to be reinforced. Like they come and play this game, not because they have to, they come and play this game at all levels because they like, because they like to, and, and they want to be better at it. So the players want to be coached and that's what I should constantly remind coaches to do. And, especially a lot of times when they can't do something, it's not because they don't want to do it. It's because they potentially can, or we got to change the way we coach it too. So um, it just constantly stays to like the script on it too. Well, Vin, I know we've talked before. Andy brought this up the other day and I think I attributed it to the wrong person. I I believe I heard it from the first time for you that the, the players write the practice plan. Is it, are you the one who shared that with me first? That's something you say all the time. That's me. (laughs) That's a pretty much, my deal yeah but the uh um you know when i talk about the players writing the practice plan there's a lot of video i think there's a lot of drills and stuff you can find on youtube i think ultimately like their ability and what their challenges are when you grade it out and you grade out really skills-based stuff is we really start to see what their limitations are and and there's there's a couple of reasons you know there's a couple of basic reasons i'm sure you can expand on it from there but there's basic reasons why somebody is not able to perform it's it's because they're in a bad position or because they haven't been in that position or they or they haven't been in that position they're not familiar with it before so one of the things we try to do is we try to stay to pretty much our core fundamentals everywhere that i've been no different here and in the short period of time that we had but just figure out what is the actual core fundamentals that they have and uh, that they have to perform and how do they get to that place it's so a space is always a big thing and i know andy's been huge and working with the, the VDA stuff and the vision, decision and action stuff and coupling that with like what Richie's done, and especially really taking advantage of like that whole idea, that whole fight mentality and that fight to track is, um, you know, we, we kind of couple those things together and say, we're getting you to this point to perform this aggressive action. Like what are the things in between you and that point that, that are in the way? And like, we almost kind of like have a saying, we kind of like walk the path of what that is. And if we walk the path of what that is and say, like, let's think about this, let's think about what we're asking this, you know, 18-year-old, 19-year-old to do based. We're asking their eyes to be over here, their body to be over here, them to work around here and then work back in this position. It's like, it's a lot to ask sometimes. And you start to say to yourself, like, have you ever, like, actually walked that path um, before we actually run that path? And then, and then we do it bit by bit and we compartmentalize the thing in, into um, – into areas that we can kind of like fundamentally get to. And sometimes it really just does, does come down to our ability to go ahead, put their body in a position that they're familiar with. One of the things like with Richie working with him on, on the thigh board tackle stuff and all the low stuff and when it goes down to the lower level, even when we were at Wagner when we first met with Rich was like, we looked at from the fact that 
everything we talked about running our feet was about our chest and our eyes being being up and being square. But now we're asking you to lean over. So that's when we put the swoop drive drill together. It was just a matter of being able to lean on something and press forward in a sprinter type stance and actually fight your feet to accelerate and actually guide something unweighted forward. And we had incredible challenge with, challenges with it. And then, but a couple of times, there's just total unfamiliarity. But you're asking somebody to run their feet. But like every drill, we had to run our feet. We had them vertical with their hips higher, their shoulders square, and we never had their shoulders down and their eyes having to be up at the same time. We actually now infuse that into our Monday conditioning, which was totally different. So that's a station now in our Monday conditioning for every player because now it's just a fundamental skill that we're going to actually ask them to do is be in, a, in an unfamiliar, I shouldn't say bad body position, unfamiliar body position and actually generate force and power and accelerate. So we just do it on a daily basis now. And we infuse it into the, into the um, strength program as well. I know Andy and I have been no, talking that's... about that quite a bit in, in infusing these things into, into your, especially now as we get into the postseason, some of your postseason things, that there's some fundamental movement skills that you can incorporate into your strength and conditioning program and not violate, you know, I know – NCAA has a ton of rules, states have rules, not violate any rules in terms of teaching directly football skills, but really it is. It's teaching the elements of something that's important, getting your body in the right position to make a tackle. Andy, I'll, I'll let you jump in there. So, sorry for cutting you off. Well, yeah, I know I know. Coach has done something that I think all coaches can learn from, and I'd love you to, to speak on that. But, you know, you work – with your strength and conditioning coaches at, at previous stops and, and here as well and designing your, your Monday conditioning stuff on, you know, here's some body positions that I want our guys to be really good in or grip strength or clamp strength is really important to me as a head coach. And then being able to bridge that gap and letting them help you develop the core abilities, kind of the, the physical qualities that then you can take and apply in your skill sessions. And I think the way you've gone about that at previous stops, and like you said, including unfamiliar body position or, or reshaping position drills into your conditioning is a great thing that other coaches can learn from if you can expand on that. Yeah. And, and, and even like, you know, it, it depends. Some places you end up with a full-time strength staff. So obviously there's that, there's that component. And some places you end up with people that are strength, you know, running your strength that are also position coaches. And regardless of what it is, like they have to have input because they have, they have, you know, and I learned and working with a number of strength coaches over the years, like they have a philosophy and not all their philosophies are just the same. It's not just go to the weight room. You know, like sometimes coaches do think that way. They say, well, that, that, that's not my area. Like sometimes they treat it like special teams too. They're just like, Oh, that's special teams. And they kind of like, I'm just going to, there's a real defined, like everybody has a philosophy like in that too. So you have to obviously respect the difference in philosophy from one strength coach to the next, and then speak to them about like, I'm looking for them to get here. Like we have to generate power and generate force here, but what can we do? And in some places like with coach Vargo or at like Wagner, he would, he would, uh, when he researched, he researched certain sleds for like off season conditioning. And you went out for like summer workout and like he ended up with like, Hey, look, we've put these, we put these in place because these will assist us in like our ability to put a body position in a fight to accelerate you know, they did tire flips sometimes at the end of practice instead of con instead of conditioning to generate that force on dip time, you know, on, on stuff like that. But again, and it was crossover skills. It kind of makes you look at like everybody's skill set and blocking and tackling and, and the basic fundamentals of, of like really all of football. But even when we were here, it was areas where we looked at even on a Monday condition. We changed our Monday conditioning from straight line running to the ability to have a little bit of a, um, a, of a rotational kind of skill set. And one of the things we do is like the fourth quarter drill type of thing where it's like, we're going to put you in the position that you're going to be most fatigued at the end of a game. And we're just going to continuously have to rep that position. So everything from running hoops, everything from jumps, everything from wall balls, anything that we can think of cones, ladder drills, things like that, where we have to remain shoulder square, we have to remain fundamental, everything like swoop drive. We put that all in together in those rotations and then make it obviously competitive and there's a team-based thing with it, too. So it's not just that straight line running like we have to do 25 sprints on a Monday just for quote-unquote conditioning, but there was, the heart rate got up. Um, the players played a little bit harder. They were with their position group, so they were like-minded people. 
So it wasn't about like, I'm going to watch the, the little guys run and the big guys are going to like, kind of like half run behind them on like a Monday run, like we traditionally have done. So we changed all that. And again, their input is, in, is incredibly important because that's their area of expertise. Um, those worlds have to merge together because you can't just say, well, it's not my problem. That's, that's theirs. That's ultimately what has that synergy with everything that you do. And it also, and then, you know, the thing too, in a short period of time that we had at this place, it's able to bring the team together. It was able to really get their feedback of what worked and what didn't work. And player surveys helped us improve our strength program like right away. I know, Vin, you talked a, a, a little bit about the, the player surveys and that being a great tool for you. Again, you're learning this team, I mean, on the fly. You've had no you know, off-season with these guys. Uh, you have new staff members in mixed with old staff members. You have all kinds of different dynamics, and you felt that some of the in-season surveys you were doing and feedback you were getting were critical for you guys to keep things on track. Yeah, and you know, one of the things we found was you don't know what people think about you because you only know about you. And if you feel like you're an approachable person, maybe you're not as approachable as you think. So one of the things is is that uh, every year, traditionally at Maritime and at other programs you've been to, you always do like a postseason survey. You usually do something, what would you, would you like, what didn't you like, what would you change, all that other stuff. And you take it into account and you reflect on the season. One of the things that was kind of came to with, with this really, really dynamic group was I was like, why would I wait till the end of the season to improve my program? <laughs> like that really makes no sense. Like I have a ability right now. I think we're at that point. We were two and two, maybe three and two, right at the midpoint of the season. And I said, we have an opportunity here in the real dog days. Like when it gets into October, we have a real opportunity, a genuine opportunity to improve our program now. And I had 23 seniors that I had inherited from the, um, from the previous year who were dynamic in what they did in their leadership. And I said, why wouldn't I let one of them to be more of this process? Like, and I stumbled upon a piece of paper that was left in coach's office and they had three team goals. And one of them was unity. The other one was accountability. And the other one was mindset. And I put, and I, we reviewed that in every single meeting that we had. And I said, well, I said, unity. And I said, they really, I feel like what happens is as they get later in the season, the seniors start to go their way and the freshmen start to just try to make it through. And I said, I don't know if I'm getting that right now. I said, so way to build unity. Let the seniors take a lot more of a role, right? Mindset. I was like, all right. So in order to change the mindset of this thing, I'm going to have to actually put them in, put them in play a little bit more and challenge them. And if I'm going to challenge them, I got to figure out what they like and what they don't like, right? And then obviously the accountability piece. And the accountability thing with them, which I figured out, was they were their goal was accountability. But the accountability wasn't just with each other. It was also for us. And I wanted them to hold us accountable for what we did. Because one of the things that we did was we, we grade them pretty pretty strongly. We grade them pretty um, tough when it comes to some of this stuff. We ask a lot of them. But they never had an opportunity to grade us. And I said, then this is a different kind of generation. There's a two-way street here. So what we did was we allowed to open up an open forum, and it was go ahead and grade us. And we found out things, and we went to the staff room, and we made a list. Everything from you talk too much. Okay. So I had to talk less. And one of the things, the reason I said, one of the ways I talked less, was I let the seniors talk, and they, they talked a lot more, and it, it got more mileage out of the football team. So one of the things that we were able to do by, by doing it was get so much feedback. We just made a list, and every day, just like we, we started the program about making sure that things were at a top level, we just kind of almost redid that from the beginning of the season because things had moved so fast over the first, like, seven or eight weeks that we almost, like, reinstituted some stuff for the season. We changed the lifting schedules for them, like, this, you know, different things in pregame that they wanted. I mean, there was things that you would never think of that you're sitting there going, I, I forgot about that. Like, like maybe one time I skipped something and it was like, I just kind of like skipped it from there on in. So you're like, Ooh, I didn't realize that, but they realized that. And that's, what's important. It's their team. So by doing it in season, it was helpful. And then one of the things we actually instituted was we instituted a vote for like assistant coach of the week. And, and the players got to vote for which coach and they gave comments as to why they thought somebody was assistant coach of the week. And it was a morale builder for our staff because it's, a, it's tough. It's not easy to coach football for, for that many weeks sometimes. And it wears on you. And, you know, it was helpful for, for our players to, uh, to uh, be able to vote for coaches of the week and, and assistant coach. And when they did it, guess what? <laughs> we have morale in our office improved because guys were like, hey, congrats on being coach of the week, being recognized by something there. So we're human beings. We want to be recognized for what we do. And, coach that's not always calling the plays or the head coach that's doing the 
phone interview or something like that isn't the one that's always going to get recognized. So we and we put it out publicly in social media. So people felt a little bit better and they worked a little bit harder because they saw some end games that supported each other a little bit more. So, you know, it's just, again, it, it was just about building those things up. And now, now I'm actually in a place where we're doing our postseason. We're getting ready to do our postseason surveys. And I actually sent the same. I said, what do I ask? I said, I'm going to ask the same things we asked in midseason and compare them. And, and, and like, that's really where we're at. So we'll hopefully have some, some improvements off that, but you can't, it's not, we couldn't take a week or next year kind of, um, kind of philosophy on that or make a notebook and say, we'll change it when it gets, when, when, the, when the new group comes in, these guys worked too hard for that. So we wanted to make sure to really give them the most we can give them. I love the, the concept coach. And I was wondering if we'd be able to get maybe a, an example of that in season survey and maybe even what the, the ballot looks like for the, staff member of the week i think those are two unique things that we haven't seen before if you'd be able to share something with our listeners i think sure. they'd appreciate it so we'll put great we'll put that up on show notes yeah and it's as simple as uh, as simple as making a you know stuff that i took from rob everett's ideas and, and just taking like google forms and just saying who's the assistant coach of the week and put the coach's name up and comment mm-hmm. and that was it just as simple as that and then be able to have a graph there but the number of guys that will walk by the office and go, hey, uh, how's the voting going? <laughs> like, it's like, they care. <laughs> they care. They definitely care. <laughs> well, I know we, so, but that's good. We, we got off a little on a tangent here, but I thought really interesting things you're sharing with us in, in the approach to the season. And, again, I think it's something you learn by really having to hit the accelerator from day one and be able to, to get your program moving. So I think a lot of great ideas there. But we mentioned – the player writing the practice plan, and really what we wanted to talk about today is kind of the aspect of the opponent writes the practice plan as well. And you did a great job this season, and Andy wants to dig into the, the tackling and manipulating drills to you know, fit each weekly opponent. And uh, so I'll, I'll let Andy kick that off and ask a few questions there. No, and I think the best place to start for, for coaches out there, you know, for you – we're talking about striking that balance between correcting some of the mistakes, but also preparing for what we feel is is coming at us the next week. And again, you were probably in a heightened situation because not only were you correcting mistakes, you were still installing uh, your tackle philosophy that you brought with you. So talk to us about how you strike the balance between teaching, installing, correcting, and also the preparation phase, because those, those those sometimes can be very different drill sets. Oh, and, and again, it was something where we're looking at skill and ability, because we had to, over the past couple of years, and really kind of getting some depth with Richie and with you, Andy, we had come not only familiar in having multiple seasons, whether it's spring, summer, and fall, to be able to see what the actual abilities of our players were. So we were actually doing skill evaluation at the same time too. So, and infusing a program and teaching at the same time as well. So, I mean, the biggest thing was, it was no different than anywhere else was not to, and, and, and this is actually interesting with the two, because a couple, both things together. Uh, a lot of people, we actually did a reverse something when it comes to contact too. A lot of people get to this point where they have, you know, heavy padded days and they have stuff in camp and they actually go one way, right. And then in the course of the season, um, and then when they get to a certain point, people start to debate about when to take the pads off and when to reduce contact. We actually flipped that model. So what happened was because we were introducing a lot of sk- a lot of new skills to it, we spent a lot of time almost um, like in less pads early in the season. But the remarkable thing is as the season went on, probably about week five, week six, we actually increased pads and increased contact because we were like on the flip side of the model. Because And we felt good because we spent more time – more time probably teaching and less time with contact early. And once we got that rhythm going, we felt much better with contact. We probably was in a much safer place when it came to contact because our contact was much more fluent. So, and, and coupled with it, I felt that we were more physical as the season went on than by comparison to the early in the season, just because we had gotten used to being so much faster to contact with it too. So those were some of like the big, the big ticket items. But the other thing too was we would look at, you know, like anything else, it's, it's always footwork first for me. So it's always about what can they, how can they get to body control from different areas? And we don't spend a lot of time with our down linemen and trying to like a lot of spatial stuff. Do not, I really am not a big supporter of that. We do a lot of restricted stuff, a lot of one arm restricted stuff, a lot of hoop stuff off of that too. So we do that, and that was one of our, our main focal points there. So that was new, a little new for them. 
we had done some in the past with them, but really nobody was there had done that before. So we did some of that. And then a lot of the other stuff was about like fitting into scheme about spatial stuff. And it was about working together where your support was going to be. And again, it goes back to a little bit of footwork. It came back to like the near foot footwork. Um, one of the things we actually did was because you end up with, this is actually something interesting too, was when we were teaching a lot of tackling stuff at the early stages of camp, we would put our upperclassmen in the groups, right, that were there. And our lower classmen, we actually did fundamental tackling with. So one tackling one-on-one. So like our freshmen did not go into groups because our, our lines were generally longer. And one of the things that happened was the special teams coordinator is an offensive coach. So I pulled the special teams coordinator for the tackling circuit. And he worked with every kid that was pretty much, we kind of put into the category of like needing fundamental skills. Basically, most of it was freshmen, but the majority of it, freshmen and then probably developmental guys. So we had a developmental unit there that was there too, that they did their own tackling drills as not to, to be able to catch up. And when we saw them actually start to improve, then we infused them into the regular groups. And then it also gave that special teams coordinator opportunity to see some younger guys and see what they can actually handle, especially in space, to potentially use down the road too. And as a matter of fact, I think four or five of them actually ended up on a variety of special teams during the course of the season, which was helpful and kind of, reducing some of the plays that our starters had to take down the road. But it was really, really like, helpful when it came to like that stuff. But, again, it comes back to being able to look at the one-on-ones of it, too. Um, one of the things, too, not having a pad at spring practice was I, con- I constantly, constantly, constantly looked at an area of evaluation and constantly looked at an area of development for our younger guys. So if there was any opportunity for them to get live reps versus each other at the end of a practice, if there's any opportunity for them to compete, we want we almost infuse the two things together because you don't get that opportunity to put them in pads again until next August. So we wanted to get them as much as possible involved and not just let them be standing there and doing nothing. So to get their own isolated area, to be able to compete with somebody at the same general skill level was really like having being able to do that because it's like really having the winter, spring, and summer season all in one kind of there well on a side note and just because we've you know been able to chat over the season you know i know that keith and i have both proposed a, a lot of stuff about giving players ownership of of play calls and starting to learn a little bit about them and and some of those freshman scrimmages you would let your your team leaders or your your quarterback or your signal callers on defense operate as as the coordinators and start to make the play calls so they get a feel for and you get a feel for how they react to, to formation threats and or places on the field, which I thought was a credible way to allow your coaches to do some more evaluation, but also get your players really deep involved in the scheme. Again, with less time, any kind of, of the sneaky ways you can get them interacting with your teachings and your philosophies helps them to generate that, that understanding that they're going to need, you know, come late in the season in those big games. Yeah, and that was like that was one of the things too when I had to get the coordinators, especially too, because everybody wants to be able to have the answer, almost like the parent wants to answer the question for the child. And it was just like back off, guys, just back off, let them go, because that, that's exactly what it is. Because when it comes down, push comes to shove, they're telling you what play they're comfortable with, they're telling you what their what what their philosophy is when push comes to shove. It's like when they're backed up, that's the blitz they want to run. <laughs> that's what they want to run. That's what they want. So figure out a way, keep that in the back of your mind, because. You may not have that play, but you may have to look at what a version of that play is because that's what they're going to be. That's what they want. That's what their mind is telling them, their body's telling them. And you, it's not about us always being right. It's about us working together um, to get the right answer. So, so it's like, so I try to kind of infuse that at all times. And I tell them sometimes you have to learn by watching and not by doing as coaches too. So, I mean, you watch them naturally. The other thing too is for me, is um, at the end of the season, uh, with all the little scrimmages we had, one of our Monday nights we actually canceled conditioning, and we actually had a uh, we called it a futures game. So we allowed our, our developmental kids to play against each other, like in a game. We had made a big deal. It was game jerseys and everything, and like we actually had guest coaches from the campus, um, you know, representatives from the faculty, representatives from the administration, be that guest head coaches, music, the whole nine flags, the whole thing video of it made it really made it their night too and it was something that was remarkable for them to be able to have that experience especially in division three when they didn't have to make some decisions at an academic school about moving forward with their football career there's something that they can say that they they enjoyed that was there too and they'll bring them back for a little bit more because I, I the one thing i pledge i've always pledged at the, at the place we're at now um the number one recruit that we have is, the, is we already have that kid 
like not the kid that's in high school right now. We have to continuously recruit every single year that same kid back. And if we're just going ahead and making an experience that's not enjoyable for them, we're not doing a great job as recruiters. Because if you have a four-year Division three player who's going to graduate, that does remarkably more for your program than bringing in new people every single year. Well, I think that's a, a great point, even for the high school coach, that you're still recruiting the guys on your roster. I mean, the guys that are second string on your roster and not maybe getting as much playing time, you're recruiting them for next season. So by making them feel valued, by giving them opportunities to show their skill, by having the coaches genuinely evaluate some of those scrimmages and that freshman work, A, it helps you understand your players better for when they come back, what their strengths and weaknesses are, but it shows that there's a genuine interest, and that may help that kid stay in in the sport or stay on your team um, instead of feeling undervalued. So I think Keith would agree that's that's definitely something that all coaches could use. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the the development side is so important. You know, just listening to some of the ways you do that, the groups that you pull out. It reminded me. I think of it in schools. Like we do that where, and I mean, there's there's some controversy to it whether that's the right thing to do or not. But you know, you. You group kids according to their ability so that you can give them the support you need. And sometimes that's within a classroom. Sometimes, you know, that's separate. But the idea is you're servicing those kids to the best of your ability. So to be able to pull kids out and, like you said, have a coach who's going to step off to the side, get them to where they need to be rather than just throwing them into the same pace and, and the same teaching as everybody else, I think is huge and shows the commitment to developing those guys that you're just not a, a number. Uh, you're not somebody who we're going to recruit and whether you succeed or not is on you. We're going to continue to develop you through the process. And coaches too, because I also had a, the coach I had was a uh, special teams coordinator. He was an offensive coach. He never taught tackling before. Mm-hmm. So, so to be able to work with, to work with the players was key too, because he had coaching points. It was the first time he ever did it to that kind of a level. And the drills were form fit for, well, we wanted spatial stuff, you know, using the noodles, using things like that, where they had to go ahead and have some timing and accuracy inside of there and it really start to infuse. And the other thing, too, was introducing the five fights, but not officially always having to tie it in every single time to like what the fights were, just gradually introducing that stuff, introducing some of the things that we had with a coaching point. Like, don't like don't overcoach and try to get everything in a day, but and introduce things at the right time when mastery happened was like key too for different people. And uh, and just being passionate about it. I mean, like really, really passionate about it. And, like making it important. I think that's, you know, there's a lot of people that talk about tackling, and there's a lot of people that talk about like just our fundamentals in general. But you no know, different from like Steve over at Siasi over at you know FIU, who's a close friend of mine. Like he's passionate about offensive line play and often and, and different different fundamentals inside of there. Like, you know, the reality is you have your passion has to show in what you're teaching. You can't just be like, well, we have to do this thing. And I'm like, I really like to talk about it. Like, but. Like, it's just like, yeah, I get known for, like, sometimes what comes to the tackling piece of it, too. But you just you really do have to be involved. You have to really love it, though. And you have to be able to go ahead and love it, all the aspects of it, too, just to kind of – and that's got to show. It just can't be a thing that you do. Uh, and they, that's what gets them to believe in it, too. So, I mean, that's just kind of, like, my two cents on that whole deal. But, uh, you know, we, we – and then, and then kind of, like, as the season progressed, then you start to look at the opponent. And um, we, we just recently had a triple option opponent – unbelievably coached team. The two teams that we faced that three teams, I should say that we faced that run triple option have managed to take a rule, a cut rule that is pretty much anti what they do and be able to manage that rule to coach it so well that it's not a penalty and be, and do a phenomenal job with it. So, you know, we had to prepare our players to cut and to cut. And the other thing too, is with, with that being said, we had to stay in position in that low position and not pop back up. Cause when you look at like Richie with the dip time and everything, like you have to almost stay dipped inside the extended dip time and be able to accelerate through. So, you know, we drilled that coming week, you know, we're not a hundred percent on it, but we put our players in the best position possible to be able to be successful. That's what we're most proud of. Film will show that we got cut out a few times in a game like that, but they get the coach too. But I can tell you the one thing we're proud of is that we actually put them in the right position to be able to defend it. And they just didn't, they were prepared for it. But again, looking at it, you had to reteach and say, like, yeah, you're not popping back up and then popping back down. You have to accelerate right through that thing and stay in that position and go. And again, it goes back to training from the eyes all the way through the hands and the feet 
and then being able to get to those fundamentals. When when you're looking at practice structure, and we're talking about the specific opponent, what what types of things are you going to look at to adjust those drills to make them specific to an opponent? For example, you know, I think think back to a team I had. We were a heavy stretch team, right? So if you were practicing kind of downhill tackles all week long, you almost wasted your time if if you are an opponent. But when I think of kind of how not just tackling gets practiced, but we get into, you know, what we call everyday drills, that we, we don't necessarily tweak things and set them up to be specific for that particular week for the things we're going to see. So for you, what's the process? How do you start to look at that from set of drills through your practice periods and, and bringing everything together? It's kind of a weird thing that I do, and it takes a little while sometimes, but you get used to it after a while, is I try to one of the things I do with tackling is I actually I take every one of our players that's lined up and I draw an arrow all the directions that we're asking them to go on the base fundamental like the five to six base fundamental plays that they're going to play so I draw an arrow in all directions and I start with that in there I mark off usually I mark off who's going to potentially be in their way and what type of block are they going to throw and then I look at potentially what the contact, I believe the contact would be, whether it be an inside shoulder, outside shoulder, working from there. I could do that for run and I do that for pass. Basically, it's basically what I do based on what they do. And I just designed it off of that. And it really just comes back to, the, to some fundamental things. It's always going to be spacing first. How much space do they have to cover? What's the obstruction that's in the way? Right? And then how much time is it going to be afforded for them to get into position and, and to get their body into position? And what body position can I predict that they're going to be in? Is it going to be from the chest to like the waist? Is it going to be from the waist to the thigh board? Or is it going to be like an ankle tap where it's going to be from the knee down to the, uh, down to like the feet is basically there too. And we kind of look at that. And sometimes when we infuse the noodle drills, we do it basically because we might play something where we feel like we're going to get a lot of quick game. And we're going to have corners in space and they're going to be Zadum. And that's what we're going to end up with. Or we end up with something where we're going to get a power team and we're going to do a little bit more one arm pair size type stuff with the inside backers because we're going to have to press a lot of backs uh, blocks and we're going to have to go ahead and spill a lot of things and we're going to end up with somebody on top of us. So I think that all gets kind of designed from there. And then one of the things we do on every, I guess you could say Thursday or Friday, our last contact day is we do team tackling drill, which I've like posted in the past too, where everybody has a repetition of like an obscurity. So we do that for two days. We'll do the ones that we predict. And then one day we get an obscurity kind of thing. So the obscurities usually are for the, for like the linebackers, a lot of stuff where it's uh, over the middle type stuff. And we want to go ahead and get that dip time. We're doing like, for the most part, a lot of that stuff is penalty avoidance. So we, with, it's rules-based stuff on like one day a week. So, and we do it all together and we try to get as many reps as possible. We do a five minute period of team tackle. We film it. Everybody goes at one time. And we almost see where we are spatially on the field together to do it. And that, that's helpful, too, because the safeties do a lot of stuff where we do targeting. I was most proud we didn't have any targeting this year, no targeting penalties, because we do rep that every single week. Every ball in the air, they throw a lot. So one of the things is, too, we want to make sure to lower our levels. We, do, we review that at least once a week, where we go back into all the stuff, the ball in the air stuff, and especially with the, with the linebackers on the crossers, everything like that. So we do go through that once a week, and then we do um, the hoop stuff off of that for the defensive line once a week with that something they may not see. But for the most part, we're going to do something where it's predictability based off of it. Um, if it's going to be a, a veer release team, we're going to end up like playing off the block for like a, for like a defensive lineman. You know, like I said, as a power team, we're going to do a work off of pressing blocks. If it's a, an option team, we're going to work off of cuts. It's just all of that stuff is really going to be like, what's the obstruction? And then what do we end up with it? And especially with how much time are we going to have to put our body in position and what positions our body going to be in? And then that, that really goes back to like the in-season piece. And then we grade it, and then we look back at it, and then we kind of see if we were right or we were wrong, and then kind of just go week by week on it too. And then one of the things that for me, especially with the last couple of years, maybe not as much this year just because I had to like watch everything, but for the last couple of years, you kind of, when you do something with tackle predictability for me, and you don't get the people in the position, you learn right away that they're doing something in scheme that's not what you expected. And a lot of times I look at so much points of contact I can probably tell them, like, why is that person blocking that person? That there is something different that's happening. And I probably look back schematically more by tackling, by doing that over the last couple of years, just because I can, because I'm looking and seeing, like, 
why a person's making a tackle to where they are on the field. Like I didn't predict that that was going to happen. So there's a reason why it's happening because I know the kid's skill ability. So I know the player's ability. So I know he could probably get to where he had to get to, but why is he out there? And they're doing something. They're doing something that's different. So it kind of like helps you look at that from a, from a, even from a, uh, a scheme standpoint and be able to provide that feedback for the in-game adjustments that you have to make. Well, coach, that's, that's absolutely pure gold in my mind. And let me see if I can sum it up and let me know if you're correct. So obviously, you know, you grade your film in your first day, you know, might be your, your corrections based on the, the technical areas, the five fights or the KPIs that you struggled with. Then you're looking at two days that are going to be based off of your predictability model. And I love the idea. I think it's something any coach can do where you draw up their, like you said, five or six most, most common plays. You draw your arrows and assign your blockers and you think, okay, this team likes to run stretch and this team throws a bubble off of it and they maybe have a nice little counter. So we're thinking our inside backers are going to have to do long distance track and, you know, work into those alleys, be it on the stretch or the bubble. We'll decide which blocker is going to be and what, you know, what movement we'll add into the drill. We may work the counter with a change of direction and pressing a block and, or change of direction in a, in a one arm restricted tackle there. And then the final day, your penalty prevention circuit, where you're truly working on accuracy for the crossers and the deep ball for the back guys. And then the, the quarterback aspect for your front guys running the hoop. And I mean, that's a pretty substantial tackle week. And what I think I like best about it is it it's going to change week to week. The film is going to dictate my correction days. The opponents dictate my, my predictability days. And then our target accuracy for the penalty prevention circuit is, is always pretty solid. And I think that's, you know, a, just absolute gold that anybody can use and from speaking to you the other thing that i know you do really well is that when you're looking at your corrections and your predictability you have some really strong themes in there we talked about refinding body position tracking in space with various teammates so who am i going to be working with to vice this ball carrier based on play calls and formation and then obviously dip time in the cleats in the ground and really from those core values you just create a drill that fits fits the scheme, and and I don't know if there's you know anybody out there uh, that's doing it as well as you and uh, Coach Everett right now. So we appreciate if you've been putting up on on Twitter and giving us insight into how you actually get it done. Yeah, and the other thing you know, and just about being creative and not trying to you know, um, and keeping them and keeping them excited about it too. Like that, it's not robotic. I think that they're one of the things that more than anything else, that our players are. They 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 love the tackling because they stay with the core concepts, but they never know what they're going to expect. You know, and it's challenging, and we challenge them. Whether it be from putting the bands on the on the bags, or you know, whatever it is, or jerseys, or whatever we can come up with. But it's always about like you know, you come walking out and you have like a bag full of pool noodles, and guys are like, "What is going on here today?" And they're 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 interested, and they're having fun. Whether it be that whether it be that we have a crash mat and we in the hot days we wet it down, you know what I mean? <laughs> like like that kind of thing we call a drill splash mountain or something like that. Like, you know, just to be able to take off of a foot and drive, it, it, you get the fundamental skill set that's off of there because you're getting them to drive off of a near foot and, and, and drive forward on something too. So, you know, those are things that we're always trying to just gain a physical advantage from, but also by keeping them involved, keeping them fun and keeping them working without always thinking that they're just working on something mechanical or robotic. Well, Vin, a lot of great stuff here. And as always, really appreciate you taking the time. We're going to share out a few of the things that you mentioned here. We'll share a graphic from that T-shirt so coaches can see which, what we were talking about there, along with some drills, some video of drills that you guys do. A lot to dig into here, Vinny. I'm, I'm sure we're going to have you back uh, numerous times this off season, especially as we get closer to the launch of our advanced tackling systems. I know you're a big believer in that, and uh, you have a lot of good ideas to add to that yourself. So appreciate both of you guys being here. Look forward to talking to both of you as uh, we continue towards our launch of the advanced tackling system. All right. Thanks a lot, Keith, and thanks a lot, Andy, for everything as usual. And I'll probably talk to Andy soon. <laughs> probably very soon. But Coach Big. Honestly, appreciate your time. Appreciate your your open and honest discussion here. You know, sharing with the other coaches what you actually do week to week, both in kind of the best case scenario and in, in, in a very challenging scenario coming up this year with, with five days.
please, if you are enjoying the show, go to iTunes and give us a five-star review. And reach out to these guys on Twitter. Andy is at USA Football MT. Vinny is at Coach Dig. And you can get me at, at Coach K Grabowski. Appreciate you listening. Thanks for listening to USA Football's Coach and Coordinator Podcast. For more resources, visit the Coach Performance Center at usafootball.com.